So uh, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the General Advisory Committee Charter. Um, is there a motion? <clears throat> Christine, I thought did a very good job at the last meeting presenting this, and uh, so I would move to recommend the staff recommendation uh, that we accept the charter. Second. And is there any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. With that, we'll invite the. Uh, the team from Central Vermont Medical Center down front. Welcome, Anna. Welcome, Mark. Whenever the two of you are ready, take it away. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, do you want to come forward? Yes. Would you please raise your right hands, please? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Mullen, members of the Green Mountain Care Board. I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, present this morning. Um, with me today is Mark Stanislaus, the VP for Finance from the Network, and I'm Anna Noonan, the President and CEO of Central Mont Medical Center. Today we're going to go through the revised FY19 budget projections and we're going to describe the restatement of our FY20 budget. Mark will go through the details of that and then I will follow up with the physician transfer um, discussion. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you. This is a very high level way on presentation. So if there's any conversations or any details, we can follow up with it with you from there. But just as a summarization, CVMC submitted a 2019 projection of a little bit over $600,000 back in the beginning of July. Um, that was based upon year-to-date March actual financial state or financial performance. And we'll go through that detail inside the spreadsheet following up. But since March, um, their margin has turned in an opposite direction. They had about a $200,000 plus margin year to date through March annualized. Um, that is approximately about a $4 million loss now. We believe a lot of that trend is going to continue through the 29th or through the 2020 budget. So this is gonna necessitate not only a change of the 2019 projection, but also the 2019 full budget. And then, excuse me, with the 2020 budget. So um, you have to apologize. You know, this time of year when my mind gets confused exactly which year we're in and which year we're, what we're working towards. And um, uh, you know, um, I was looking at a trail map well, with my wife, I'm gonna digress over the weekend when we were four wheeling, and I looked at the map and I said, hun, this is the wrong year, it says 2019. <laughs> so, so that tells you where my mind is, so I apologize, so it's all 2020. But, um, well, so the factors that have changed in 2019 since March for CVMC is their collections have gone backwards by approximately $3.3 million. And this is the itemization, the two primary what drivers of that is the traditional Medicare and the all-payer model for Vermont Medicaid, excuse me, and also the, their expense trend has increased by $1.5 million. There's $500,000 in additional with traveler or agency's fees or the premium salary expense that many of the hospitals have been talking about. And there's been a and there's been a $1 million increase to the employee health benefit cost from a financial statement perspective. We don't believe the $1 million is a true increase. We believe part of that was just um, not included in their year-to-date actual through March. And just a quick summarization, well, Blue Cross and Blue Shield is their administrator of their benefit plan. And because of the system conversion with Blue Cross and Blue Shield, 
and um, they were slow to adjudicate some of the claims for January, February, and March. So that full trend was not captured through March, and now all of that is caught up. And I think you heard that or from Blue Cross and Blue Shield based upon um, uh, their conversion. Um, okay, so if there's no questions there, I can walk into the financial spreadsheet and I'm gonna look at the bigger Excel version, but the columns are labeled A through M and the rows are labeled One through 11. So just for a quick summarization, column F is the 2019 projection that was, was submitted in July with a margin of approximately $678,000. The revised 2019 projection that we're talking about today is in column E, and that's showing a loss of approximately $4 million. And the difference between those two amounts are in column G. So that is a bottom line difference of approximately $4.7 million. So just to compare them, so the total NPR plus FPP has gone backwards by approximately $2.8 million. The other revenue, um, has increased slightly um, um, for a total change of $2.8 million for when you combine them, and the expenses increased by about $1.5 million, and that's how they got to the $4.7 million loss. And we believe that trend is going to continue into FY20. So I will pause there, or I will look towards um, well, the board to see if you want to pause there, or do you want to transition into the FY20 budget. Does anybody need a pause to ask some questions at this point, or let's keep going? Uh, no, I would, I would pause for a second. Um, I mean, the changes have been pretty dramatic from when you came in here. Um, even at that point, you had an annualized of, you know, the like 336, um, and you were still, you know, to see that much sway, is, is a little uncomfortable in a two month period. And both on top line, on expenses, I mean, what type of controls do you have to be preventing this from happening in the future? I mean, last year you lost $8 million and obviously that was significantly off where your budget was. So this has been a trend that's been going on for a couple of years. And just wanna talk about, you know, what controls you have and checks and balances both on the top side and the expenses to prevent such a significant shift occurring again in 2020 and okay well so from a margin perspective that is a considerable impact but when you take a look at the shift in the collection rate which is well so basically well the revised collection rate is 49.5 percent and the projection was 50.6 percent if you look on row two now, that's only a difference of a little bit over 1%, but it's very meaningful when you talk about these total numbers. So while that's a significant change, well, from a 1% well, you know, difference, um, I think you need to break it down, or you know, we need to break it down into the two driving factors, okay? On the traditional side of Medicare, there was a little blip at the beginning of the year that, that there was some double payment for the fee-for-service and the all-payer model. So some of that needed to be backed out, so there was some noise factor um, on that side of the equation. And then, as far as the impact CBMC um, on the all-payer model, specifically in Medicaid, and you know, given with our Medicaid population, um, on the Medicaid side, there was the same issue, and One Care Vermont is actually revisiting their fixed perspective payment model and how they pay each month to help stabilize that um, uh, for each one of the entities. But to put the change in perspective, Maureen, on those two items, 
is, is on the traditional Medicaid from year to date, March through year to date, what July, there was a decrease um, in collections by approximately 3%. And the Vermont Medicaid, although a much smaller number in total, that percent variation was 6.8%. So all we can do is continue well to monitor those. And the way a lot of this accounting works is it is on a reserve accounting model. It is it's based upon your prior month's actual that you apply to your current business on what's going to be when you're collected. And there was a blip in that. So it was significant from a bottom line perspective, but from an NPR perspective, it was only an impact of about 1.5% if you look at it in total. So um, our concerns are exactly the same. You know, the margins are very small. Um, in this case, you know, CVMC has a negative margin. It is an improvement over the prior here. So obviously any change um, uh, has its impacts. So, you know, I can't explain it exactly, um, to be honest with you. All I can say is that it seems like a fair trend and we're gonna need to continue to monitor it too. Uh, um, uh, that's probably not the best reassuring answer. It's not the best reassuring answer to myself either, candidly. But, you know, um, we have a very complicated payment system. We're in the middle of change. And there's a certain aspect of it that we're, you know, well, we're all getting familiar up to the process as we're going through it, too. Um, okay. It just, it just is going forward, making sure you know, the expenses are tracking, you know, we know you work at low margins, yeah. so when you lose top line and then you have higher expenses and then you show a significant loss, I mean, it's, it's tough to make changes in your expense base if in fact you don't hit the top line numbers as we move now to 2020 as well. Yeah. I agree, there's a clear relationship there. So, we believe this trend is gonna carry into the 2020 budget. Well, so we carry that approximate $4 million shift you know, forward. Um, before we talk about this, that projection is under the 2%, 2% um, below FY 2019 for budget. So because of that, it shifts with CVMC's review into, um, uh, a different review process for the Green Mountain Care Board, as you are aware. So it puts the revenue cap at 5% over the 2019 well projected. So that projected is approximately 2.2% lower than the 2019 budget. And basically, and part of this is because of the timing crunch that we were all under to, to be candid. So what we did is we reduce well, the revenue line by approximately $4 million in the 2020 budget. Um, the expenses, you know, just carry forward. And the other thing I should say about 2019 too, is by carrying this forward in 2019, there were some questions about, did CVMC budget the appropriate amount of bad debt and charity? So in carrying this projection forward, there is a realignment. So the charity and the free care are in line with the current trends as compared to the previous you know, projection. There was a little optimism um, in those two categories. So on the 2020 budget, um, the proposal is a net NPR plus FPP of $218 million. There would be no change, no change to the expense base. And basically, how does that compare well, to the revenue cap? Well, 5% over the 2019 projection puts it at approximately $217 million. You know, um, uh, we'll probably need to, need to take the time to validate these numbers with your staff too, so we know that. So if they're a little off, we know one way or another, but they should definitely be in the fair range to speak about this. And, and, and then, if you think about CVMC's um, $3.1 million worth of physician transfers, which Anna is going to talk about next, 
and you add it to that 219, that would put it in the 220 category. So um, currently, right now, CVMC is a little under a million dollars or a little over a million dollars over that 5% cap. And then we still have the physician transfers to talk to or approximately 3.1 million. Um, so we'll sort of, we'll sort of summarize. Um, CVMC's 2019 projection would go from approximately $600,000 gain to a $4 million loss, and their next year budget would go from about a $4 million gain to, well, to a break even. Um, and so, uh, we you know we from the aggregate, we you know we from Anna from the CVMC perspective, from the health network perspective too. Um, we are not completely comfortable from a performance perspective with a break-even budget, but we truly feel that this is a more reasonable um, we know, budget for CVMC in 2020, and especially as we think of, 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 of the change that CVMC is gonna have over the next couple of years as it relates to some of the discussions um, on the inpatient mental health height. And, and you know, we also will believe um, presenting a budget any lower than this um, isn't fiscally the right thing to do either. You know, CVMC needs to get to a positive margin. They made progress in 2019 compared to 2018, and they still have more work to do. Um, so this is all about creating um, a responsible budget for CVMC, and this reflects about a 2% change from the original budget. If you just look at the simple math on a $4 million adjustment on 200 plus million. So that's about what the change is from the budget we projected in July. And I'll pause there to see if any, Anne has anything to add and then we can tackle any questions. Any questions related to the revision of 2019 or 2020? So I'm just trying to follow the, um, the detail here and sort out what might be one-time issues and what are ongoing issues. And so let me just ask, um, going forward, are, is it your experience now that all the issues with Blue Cross Blue Shield um, are back on track and that's not something that will be or will not be something that will roll into 2020? That should not be something well, that rolls into 2020. 20 after we capture the change uh, um, there. And you know, keep in mind that um, well, when we say issues, this is a normal transition when anyone goes through a conversion. The delay claims to make sure it was right. Well, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, they were running parallel systems. And, 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 and then you know, we want to be clear that this was just the processing of ABM scenes own health plan expenses. Um, so we believe that's as clean as it can be in 2020, as long as there isn't a change in health care spend um, for the employees. And I'll pause. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> next, in, in terms of uh, um, a, a, um, a one time, <clears throat> the uh, traditional Medicare uh, um, um, d d uh, the double payment with Medicare, is that, because I, I think in looking at what some other hospitals have told us, that's still an outstanding issue that things have not yet been fully resolved with Medicare, um, um, and people are kind of circling around what the number will be, but is this something that you think you've captured and um, will, will, will not roll into 2020? Well, we feel that we've captured, well, you know, the best that we can, knowing what we know today, and there are still conversations we know, with Medicare. A lot of those conversations now kind of carry over to the settlement of the all-payer well, versus well, the traditional Medicare. And, and, and you know, um, uh, hopefully there's no double processing by Medicare in January 2020, and, and it would make it easier on all of the hospitals and the all-payer model too. So. Um, um, I can tell you well that we're productively working through it all together with Medicare and the folks over at One Care, you know, Vermont. But you know, we feel that um, well, the cleanup uh, in the adjudication system for the fee for service has caught up, um, meaning everything has been reversed. 
um, on the fee for service. So, you know, this is the best estimate that we have at this time. Um, and finally, I'm just looking at your, um, uh, get the right paper here in front of me, your FFP rate. And, you know, you've, uh, Central uh, Vermont has done a good job at, um, in terms of participating in the all-pair model. Your percentage of, of uh, net present revenues is well above the system-wide average. Uh, um, but in this situation, I'm just wondering if, if there's a bit of a problem with that. You, your projection in your uh, projection for uh, 2019 was at uh, 19, uh, $37 million, $37.7 million in FFP, and that looks like that's dropping by about $1.7 million. Um, and then rolling out into 2020, your projection was $50 million, significant increase. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, you know, uh, how uh, um, aggressive you've been in approaching uh, the rollout into 2020 of uh, an F your FFPP projection. So, um, CVMC um, is hit disproportionately by the all-payer model from a percent of business from the other hospitals, and it is one of the reasons why we believe the collection rate has gone backwards in the 2019. Because if CVMC you know, sees more services that are attributed to the enrollees, you know, let's just use Medicaid as an example only. That is one of the reasons you know, why their collection rate actually went down in 2019. That they saw more people so their gross revenue went up and their fixed payments were estimated to be the same. So it is just the math of way well, you know, dividing the two from a simple collection perspective. That's why it's less in FY 2019. In FY 20, as the budget is here, you know, that amount was actually lowered by about, um, about two and a half million dollars, give or take. Uh, yes, um, off from the projection well, that one care provided to the hospitals, only because when we talked about this with the senior leadership team over at CBMC, that we thought that was the appropriate thing to do because of this relationship issue. And this is just going to be another one of those things that we're going to have to continue to monitor. But, you know, that change felt like it is the right thing to do. Um, well, so that's why it was made in the 2020 budget. You know, keep in mind that we're talking about small percentages on big numbers, but they're very meaningful, you know, when it filters down to the bottom line. But those are some of our same concerns too, Tom. Um, I know this hospital has, you know, a difficult payer mix, and, and you've talked a little bit about the all-payer model. Um, but given the new forecast and where you've been in 2018, where you've been in 2019, running at a significant loss, um, and you're keeping your expense load now the same for 19, or for what you had given us before for your 20 budget and what your forecast is, and I th I'm hoping that maybe that's conservative and that you're gonna look aggressively, whether it's at efficiencies or cost savings, because you've talked about how you want to be at about a two to three percent operating margin. I think that's where you need to be. And if this hospital didn't have the backing and support of the network, it would be a real challenge to say, you know, that this is a sustainable forecast, losing eight eight million in 2018, losing another chunk of change in 19, running at a break even in 20. And you know, I would have hoped that you, A, would be getting more synergies from the network. Um, and I know in 20, you do have some one-time epic charges that are running through and things like that. But, you know, I think really understanding where are you going forward, what's, what's it going to look like next year, I mean, what are your goals and how are you going to get there? Because, you know, this is becoming a pattern, right? It continues to happen. Whether it's, a, I agree with you, it's small on top line, you know, a couple percent change. But when you're working with a low margin and then you have issues with expenses, it becomes significant at the bottom line. So I, I'll speak to that. So to your point, um, we've cut the loss from last year and a half, so break even for next year seems like the right direction to be moving in. 
But I think it's important for the Green Mountain Care Board to know that we have a number of initiatives that are looking at operational efficiencies. The challenge with those initiatives is it does take some time to actualize those improvements. So I'm pretty confident that with those margin improvement initiatives, we will achieve not only break even, but move <coughs> forward in a way that gets us closer to that margin. So the intent is that we will continue to um, operationalize those efficiencies both across our uh, Woodridge Nursing Home, the 27 practices that we have in the acute care setting. But it does take time. No, I know it, take, it does take time, but at some point if you're operating a hospital that has a lower NPR, to continue to expect you can have higher expenses than that, you know, and not really react really quickly. I mean, we don't want, you're not gonna run into a Springfield situation, right? But all of a sudden Springfield is able to find some, you know, deeper cuts because they have to. And, you know, they've gotta get those things out of the system. And it's just trying to say, are you really pushing everything that you can? And, you know, I appreciate the improvement from 18 to 19, but 19's not done yet. And we just saw significant changes from what you gave us a month ago to now, so I'm not really confident that you're only going to end up at negative five million. But I hope that you do. I'm not saying just you know we've had significant changes from where your budget is to where you came in July 1st to where you're coming in now. Um, you know, so hopefully when everything nets out at the end of 19, you'll only be 4.8 million lost. But it wouldn't be a surprise if you were higher. Okay, there's definitely more work to do, candidly. Okay, and the more work to do is on two sides, and I guess I could say that I'm wearing my health network hat right now. Uh, um, but but we know we know CVMC um, they need to take a deep dive internally, and I think from the health network, we know we've been very candid that a key component of the performance for the Vermont hospitals within the health network is going to be this horizontal integration, and. And because these hospitals, in my opinion, and I'm speaking for the, all of the hospital systems, that there's a challenge every day to keep up with inflation of how can they keep their expense pace in line but with the payer inflation and the cost shift. So those savings, the hospitals can only dig so deep before it really changes the type of services that they have to provide. And there is scope and scale that needs to come from the health network on that horizontal integration for us to keep pace with all of this, you know, you know, payer reform. And you know, John can talk to that afterwards. But I think part of that responsibility is on the health network to navigate those integrations in our healthcare, you know, delivery system. And a big step forward there is going to be epic. So, I mean, I'll pause there and, you know, John might want to speak to that later. But, we you know, that, that is really twofold. Anna has a big responsibility for CVMC to make sure they're running as efficiently as possible. And the health network needs to find scale in savings, inefficiencies, and access to. Um, so, I think it's twofold. So I think we'll have to summarize, I mean, if I just put my pure financial hat on, I have some of the same concerns that you have, Maureen, and we're going to have to work hard to get there. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things, and I realize that it's really a timing issue, but one of the things that you discussed earlier was um, the self-insurance program. And we've seen a number of hospitals um, including Springfield actually get hit with a, a very, very expensive uh, tab. And I was wondering if you could share with us um, what your um, reinsurance uh, is that you have in place and how you try to protect that. And also if you could address, um, I remember reading an article probably 20 years ago now about how health healthcare workers are one of the most expensive blocks to insure because they know everything that could possibly be wrong with them, and they know every single test that could be done. So it's a very expensive uh, block to insure. And just if you could share with us some of the things that Central Vermont's doing to foster wellness and to uh, try to keep the expenses down on that uh, self-insured business. Yeah, 
So to your point, we have, a, I think, a pretty robust wellness program. Um, we do uh, pay our employees, give them an incentive to engage in wellness activities. We have a number of initiatives, both uh, um, related to diabetes prevention, um, exercise programs, those sorts of things. So we think we have all that in place. The challenge is um, when something unexpected ha happens. The, um, the biggest hit we've had this year is with um, oncological services. And sadly, that's not something that anyone can anticipate. Um, so the, the hit we've taken from a benefits perspective is an increase in those type of services. And the individuals that we've insured are um, needing to go outside of the network to receive the services that they're receiving. So um, unfortunately, that's a little bit of how it goes in a given year, and this is one of those years where we've been hit in that way. Um, we keep a tight control over that. We look and see you know, what, what, can, what else can we do to manage that. But the reality, there are times when these things are um, not manageable in the way that one would like. Do you have stop loss or reinsurance in place to protect you against? We do. You know when that kicks in, what the dollar figure is? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know if Mark, if you're aware of that. No, I don't. So, okay. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so, thank you for coming in and giving us this revision. Um, I share some concerns, I think, with Maureen and probably others about the expenses not being adjusted downward, um, given the downward adjustment of NPR. So my hope is that this is a conservative estimate of expenses, and as you said, there's going to be work that you're doing. I know that there is work from the hearings around care delivery system optimization and increased efficiencies that you're hoping to get through, you know, uh, through working with the pharmacy and IT and HR and all of that. So my hope is that that does come down. Um, so my question is, really, to get your bottom line, you're really relying on non-operating revenue, basically, to make up the difference. So you didn't revise that at all. Is that did you look into that to make sure that there were no adjustments that should be made either up or down, probably down or maybe down on non op or other revenue? Sorry, I should say other revenue. Total, other revenue, right? Yes. That's Sixteen million. Yes. Okay. So there's not going to be an adjustment to that related to an adjustment in NPR. No. So um, if you do look at the year-to-date July annualized. Um, um, and then um, I have a little bit more of a breakdown of what, than what you see here, um, there. But the year-to-date January annualized and other revenue was about 17 million. We're projecting about 15.4 or 15.5. And there were some one-time items in the July annualized that should not be annualized. Forward. There were some draws out of restricted funds that should not be annualized. Well, so we feel fairly confident um, um, by pulling that back a little bit because we didn't want to annualize a one-time item. That's also, and, and, and we know, I mean, there's a high reliance in this other revenue category. More than half of it is 340B contract pharmacy. Right, so I guess what I was wondering yeah, yeah. was if your NPR is coming down, would that also affect 340B revenue? No. It should not, not 340B contract revenue. Okay. So, and we can explain those nuances of the relationship after if you would like me to work with staff, but. Okay. Um, uh, but I just wanna make sure you're confident in that number because that's gonna make up the difference there, right? Given that your NPR is lower than your expenses, you really need that to get the, the 16 yes, million. <laughs> yes. You do numbers, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess, and, and I'm going to bring this up now, but I've, I've brought it up a couple times in the hearing and uh, last Wednesday, uh, this notion of regulating the network as a whole, the entire network, and giving the a total NPR for the all three hospitals with the related underlying commercial rate that would go with that. And as I said last week, this was the hope was that I think this could potentially give the network some flexibility to be more efficient within their network as patients are flowing through the hospitals, then those dollars would flow so that there's an incentive for the, each of the hospitals to make sure that care is being delivered in the most appropriate place, the most cost-effective place. And I think it let, allows the network to leverage economies of scale better. For example, we know we've heard that UVM, the medical center, is at overcapacity now. You know, they're in surge. 
this potentially looks like there's some undercapacity here. There's some capacity for CVMC, so that patient flow could happen uh, if the system was regulated in its entirety. So I'm wondering if you might provide for us with this revision uh, downward in the NPR, what it would look like for NPR for the entire system and the associated commercial rate. And you don't have to give this to us now, but uh, what would it look like for a holistic NPR for the system given this revision? Does that make sense? Yes. So, so you know, rolling it up. Yeah, so uh, um, just you know, doing, doing, doing quick math, I think the Vermont Health Network, I think is about 1.5, 1.6 billion of the NPR. So, you know, the $4 million shift as a percentage is, well, you know, it's about 0.25%. Um, you know, we absolutely believe managing the health network as a, a, as a single entity is the direction to go, but we understand that, you know, it takes time to, well, to get there. Well, so we welcome those conversations with the Green Mountain Care Board on how we could get there together. Um, so, so that's about the scale. Uh, um, we, you know, this particular change, um, um, uh, noting that it is, we you know, break even at the bottom line. We you know there's no change to CDMC's what commercial rate ask. That commercial, you know, rate ask is you know for inflation and the cost shift. Um, and no more. So, um, and I would welcome the conversation but with staff, Jess, if you would like to get into further detail on that. Other questions? Okay. Want to transition to the practices, Anna? Yes, that'd be great. Um, so, uh, we wanted to give you a little bit more detail on the proposed physician transfer requests. Um, for dermatology, um, that's uh, uh, about 480K. Again, um, this is a practice that was in Central Vermont that closed, and so we've uh, assumed and absorbed that practice over the course of a couple of years. Um, we, uh, it was, again, it was partially absorbed in last fiscal year, and the remainder would be um, in this fiscal year. The approximate wait time for dermatology at this point is 150 days, so there is an access issue there as well. In pulmonary, uh, we are having a retirement of a long-standing physician. This individual has been in our community for 40 years. Um, he will be uh, retiring. Um, he's an independent provider, so we are um, going to be assuming his outpatient practice, outpatient clinic that he does um, uh, within Central Vermont. Uh, again, the wait time for pulmonary is about 120 days. In oncology, the, um, it's a $2 million um, <coughs> increase. And we're looking at providing services as we have been for uh, not only Central Vermont, but also to uh, manage Copley and Gifford um, needs. Our recent SG2 data, which is the intelligence firm that we've been using for planning purposes for um, these kind of services, as well as for the psychiatric and patient capacity program, shows that there'll be a, about a 14% increase, almost 15% increase um, growth in oncological services are being projected for our community. Again, this addresses um, the Berlin HSA primarily. The wait time currently for oncology is about 38 days and neither pulmonary or oncology are obviously, they're not elective services. So when people need those services, they need them. So we're trying to uh, be ready to provide those services for our community in fiscal year 20. So I'll pause there and see if there's any questions from the board. Questions about the uh, transfers and acquisitions? <coughs> Patrick, does your team have questions? I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah, I guess, um, did you want to add anything before we turn it over to public comment? Yeah. Chair Mullen, um, I can either make some comments in uh, the public session or I'm happy to uh, go up to the front and raise my right hand because you all might have questions of me. Whichever at this way point. you prefer. Well, I think if you want to ask questions and have them on the record, sure, I probably should go up there. Go. He's got to stay here. <clears throat> Dr. 
Please raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I certainly do. Um, thank you for uh, letting us take a reset here. Uh, very unusual and has been pointed out in a sea of many, many moving parts. Um, we did see deterioration uh, over uh, a couple of months. Um, it does speak to our process that you know you get so far into the process it's virtually impossible until you go through the steps like this to do a readjustment but really appreciate that um, so uh, Anna uh, how many physician practice sites does Central Vermont have that you inherited 27 and uh, have you closed any of those practice sites under your tenure? We have consolidated uh, two practice sites at this point. I'm sorry, consolidated, not closed. Um, and what was the community reaction to that consolidation of practices that were a little bit over a mile apart? Um, those two practices were approximately 1.1 mile apart from one another. Um, we consolidated a, one in downtown Barrie to one that was um, literally um, a mile away. And the, um, the energy from the community was high, um, but um, I think when I went in front of the Barry uh, City Council and described the rationale for that consolidation, they understood. Um, and the reality is that going further as part of our margin improvement initiatives, we will be looking at optimizing the efficiency of those practices. And we've just completed a study that looks at if you were to wipe all those practices clean, and identify based on our market where would we place practices, they would probably place, be placed in very different locations. So we're underscoring um, that analysis now. So I'm asking these questions to make a point. We didn't rehearse this at all. If you were going to, uh, although I have heard this from Central Vermont, um, if you were gonna make uh, one major capital investment to correct your um, current financial situation in the near and immediate term, what would it be? Uh, we would consolidate our ambulatory prax practices into efficient centralized locations so we could reduce overhead costs. Part of the challenge now is we've replicated all these overheads in 27 distinct locations uh, around central Vermont, which is um, a cost burden. So we would consolidate those into a, uh, probably three main locations that are geographically dispersed, but a centralized model in, in the Berlin community. And that would yield, uh, just on the expense base, um, probably $8 million of expense avoidance at least. Um, and I bring that point up because this is a microcosm, a microcosm of all of the interrelated factors that we're taking into account and really the driver of why we brought the uh, UVM Health Network together and worked hard to support an ACO concept to bring the uh, others uh, into the fold. Um, we have to make these changes incrementally, um, if at all possible, and avoid the Springfields that create tremendous disruption. And Maureen, you're absolutely right. But for coming into the network, Porter very likely would have been in Springfield. But for coming into the network, Central Vermont would almost certainly be in dire straits right now. Hopefully we would uh, provide other safety nets through some mechanism. Um, but this is what we're all about in the UVM Health Network, is to have as many levers as possible to incrementally change and get on a firm footing financially and with the distribution of uh, services. And you know, it gets even more complex when you uh, pick up a region uh, in another state. Um, another just general line of uh, thought uh, coming out of this, we've embarked on a, um, some would say radical, I would say, long overdue transformation of the healthcare delivery system uh, financing and operations uh, in this region. We've all jumped into that uh, together. We're working really, really hard. And um, uh, the one of the inherent risks in doing that, you see in um, uh, 
what's presented here and what's happened to Central Vermont, and that's that we're working with CMMI and CMS in a way that they've never worked before. So this is not a surprise. One of the major risks going into this, and I've spoken with our board about this for the last five years, is the ability to administer the program and some disruptions in funds flow that might uh, occur. That's not to throw out the entire system. That's to realize that we're doing something innovative and new, and there's going to be bumps, there's going to be uh, funds flows issue, and I think we finally have gotten to a point where between the finance folks at One Care and the finance uh, folks in our hospitals, we're starting to get to a place where we can appropriately um, uh, look at uh, those revenues. But we have to, uh, if we're going to uh, uh, move this to fruition and believe that this all pair model is a viable model, we have to be able to roll with the uh, ups and downs and be able to make that happen. As Mark pointed out, we've made uh, tremendous investments to get us on the other side in uh, all sorts of IT. Uh, we're all on the same um, uh, budgeting system, cost accounting system. Um, we're putting in Epic, which will bring in an entirely new uh, revenue cycle. So all of these parts and pieces, whether it's down to consolidating practice sites or um, uh, the all-pair model or bringing uh, hospitals and our providers together, all are planned to have a sustainable healthcare delivery system for Vermonters and folks of Northern New York. It all comes together, but everything is interconnected. Everything is interconnected. We're making decisions to end up with a sustainable delivery system and a care model that keeps people healthy. What we can't do is um, bleed the system to a point that we don't have any buffer or any resiliency to roll with what have to be have to predict that there's going to be bumps in this road. And my solid message is the 2020 budget for our three Vermont entities are crunch time. I love the fact, um, uh, uh, Jessica, that we would consider the, uh, the three entities uh, as one as these budgets are constructed. Um, uh, and as these systems go, there is a lot of dependency on the academic <coughs> medical center, their operational, clinical, and financial health. And so I would urge that at this time, with all of these moving parts, on a pathway that we aren't just sort of wandering in the wilderness, we know where we're going, that we take the time and make sure that we're putting the resources in at this point that's going to allow us to weather these uh, bumps, uh, bumps in the road. Um, the last thing I would just remind, and this is a specific issue to Santa Vermont, uh, at least in my calculus and our calculus, we have a couple of years, 24 months, uh, to get to the budget for the next 12 months after that to have this organization in a shape that it can absorb the uh, depreciation that will come online with Psych Hospital uh, on their campus and on their license. Uh, so, um, you know, all of this uh, we're watching incredibly closely. I know it looks like things just fell off the, uh, the radar screen. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. We have finance teams and um, uh, even my time this past year, on a monthly basis, we meet with the CFOs and the presidents and go through uh, where they are. And it's just really tough to pick up, you know, what's a blip and what's a trend. You really need three, maybe even four months uh, to, uh, to really uh, understand that there uh, is a trend to some of the market points. So um, I'm wandering a little bit now, but I just want to make the point that this is a time where we need 
not even really a buffer. We just need the budgets that have been carefully crafted to uh, go through so that we have the resources to move all of these, uh, these things forward. Um, we do uh, have uh, employee self-insurance through our, uh, we actually, through our captive, which as of September 30 will be a Vermont-based captive. We have the license and everything is all done. We'd love and, you to create a promo for Dartmouth to try to do that. Um, we actually had, uh, we've had some conversations with them about uh, uh, the glide path and how that, uh, that worked. Um, I'm not, obviously don't make decisions for them, but we do uh, have um, uh, insurance stop loss for our employee health plans through the captive, and I believe the attachment point for Central Vermont is 250000 per individual per year, but we'll get your staff the specific attachment point. And then we have reinsurance on top of that that we get from one of the large reinsurers. So Dr. Brown said you, you really uh, spent a lot of time looking inward on the facility planning piece for the uh, inpatient psych beds, but also if you took a look at the overall facility, trying to make it more efficient, was the 27 practices part of that, or is it a separate planning initiative? Um, uh, I'll let Anna speak to that, because their planning on how that would uh, roll out, um, uh, but um, it's a matter of available capital uh, and timing, and again, I think if you just looked at Central Vermont in isolation, likely the first thing that they would do is ambulatory. And then if there was no uh, increase, increased site capacity, they would look at refurbishing their uh, emergency room and inpatient units to a configuration that more met what the long-term needs of that three or four county section of uh, uh, of Vermont would require, um, and so um, we're going to have to uh, do some work with practices because of where we're citing uh, the uh, uh, site uh, increased site capacity. Um, but um, the plan is there; it's a matter of timing and the um, capacity to pull it off. So to your point, yes, we've um, kept our overall master's facilities plan in sync with the development of the psychiatric and patient capacity. Um, and we studied not only the acute care campus, but um, these practice sites, as mentioned. Um, we took an approach where we uh, just wiped the slate clean and said, if just looking at our market, where would we position these um, practices? And we clearly would not have 27. Uh, to be frank, um, and um, it's hard at this point to understand the why of um, how we got there, but it, it doesn't matter really what the point is how we move forward. And to John's point, uh, if you were to have said what would be the two things that I would have done first, it would have been that ambulatory practice site um, so we could optimize our efficiencies and make it more patient and family centered and then um, uh, modernize the acute care setting, which is a 50-year plant with a lot of just deferred maintenance. Um, we're grateful that the ED will be part of the site build, but know that, um, that we do have capital challenges, as John mentioned, um, and as part of the network, we'll be looking at uh, prioritizing all of those capital needs um, in the next few months. Uh, but yes, we um, have a plan for how that should all unfold um, to really optimize the services we provide to the Central Vermont community. Questions from the board? Seeing none, I guess at this point we're going to open it up to the public for any comment on the resubmission. Pretty unusual that we're seeing none. So that's a good thing. Thank you for coming back in. I know that. Uh, it's a tough process that starts uh, very early and sometimes things can change and it's better to address it now than dealing with it next year. So um, I want to thank you personally for uh, you know, putting the pencil back to the paper and coming back in. And we'll have answers for you by the end of the week. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs>
that, I'm going to invite uh, our possible budget team up. Any 
Anyone else from the board? I'll just I'll add my comment. I think that I, uh, I can agree with this uh, recommendation, but this is one of the hospitals that I mentioned last Wednesday that I would like to see a sustainability plan from as a part of the uh, budget order. Uh, this is a hospital that's already engaging in the review of their service lines, which is good. I think it's really important. They're looking at what is the appropriate uh, service line that they should be delivering to make sure that they can deliver cost-effective care at volumes that can sustain quality. So I think part of this should be we'd like to see that analysis. Their price increases have been high in the past. This is one of the hospitals that average annual increases have been 5% over the last five years. They're not this year, they're more in line with medical inflation, but still, I think the fact that they've been over 5%, around 5% over the past five years suggests that you know, they do need to be looking at sustainability. So I, I, would, I will support this budget as submitted with that caveat. So I just share my only concern is that uh, it's the change in charge that uh, is troublesome and looking at their uh, five-year uh, growth rate and that, it uh, seems to be troubling for, for me that it's a, above 3.5%, uh, which is the target that uh, we're trying to stay with under as far as um, dealing with keeping the growth in, in spending at the same rate as the, the growth in the economy. But with that being said, if it was not part of our guidance, I think uh, that they've complied with the guidance. And so I see no reason not to vote for it. Would someone like to make a motion? I can do that. Um, I move that we approve North Country Hospitals budget with an NPR of an effective growth of 3.4% and a 4.2% overall charge with the conditions that they do a quarterly check-in relating to their fiscal year 20 operating performance and participate in uh, the work We've asked staff to do around sustainability planning with certain hospitals, and also that the budget order make a note of concern relating to the accuracy and timeliness of submissions. Is there a second? Second. 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 It's been moved and seconded. Um, is there further discussion? I just, I'd just like to add uh, <clears throat> um, to your comment um, that the rate increase uh, is above the 3.5% target, but the um, payer mix for North Country is significantly weaker than I think the average payer mix with only 47% uh, commercial. So, um, you know, I, 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 I you know, I react to the 4.2% rate in terms of it seems high, but then I'm a little bit accommodating because of their uh, relatively weak payer mix. Yeah, and I would just add to that the fact that they lost money the past two years, 17 and 18. Um, 19, it does show that they're looking to make a, a margin, and 20 forecasts as well. But that, I factor that into consideration when they're looking at the 4.2% charge, change in charge. Further comment from the board? Everyone said everything I would say, so I won't say anything else. <laughs> So at this point, I'm uh, reminded by legal that uh, we need to open it up to a public comment before we actually vote. So would anybody from the public wish to make any comment on North Country? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Southwestern. Thank you. Southwestern Vermont Medical Center is next. Um, this is a 1A and 1B type of approval. We have a, uh, a anesthesia provider transfer that needs to be approved as part of this. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, and I think you all have that information from, from last Wednesday, we have since received uh, the answers to that. 
Um, and I'll just hand it over to Adam to speak a little more on, on what that answer was. So if anybody wants to reference the um, financial breakout of this, it's slide 45 from the deck we reviewed on Wednesday. Um, but just to follow up, the hospital followed up. This was in response to Chair Mullen's question and hearing about whether or not the um, hospital-owned practice would be uh, providing this service at, a, at least the same efficiency as when it was independently owned. And there was a question about the NPR. So the response is, and this was forwarded to the board, that in the independent practice, it was about $2 million annually in NPR. Um, if you break that down to nine months, because this practice goes into effect on January 1st, so it's effectively nine months of the fiscal year, it's $1.5 million in the independent practice. And as a hospital-owned practice, they're budgeting $1.3 million. So it is $200,000 less, and they emphasized in their letter by underlining so that we could not forget it, is that they're assuming the same volume and productivity. So it is, um, it is budgeted to come in at about $200,000 less than as an independent practice. And we wanted to make sure that the board understood that. And um, since that was the only follow-up to the provider transfer vote, make sure that you have that information um, as you deliberate. So any questions about that? Any questions about the transfer? None. Are you going to talk about the accounting change? We can we can review that. We went over that last week, but we can go over that again. I don't think you have to go go through it in all all detail, but just a okay. quick summary. Let me just look to make sure. So Southwestern had an anesthesia practice up, and actually that was it. They did not have an accounting um, change. So for them, it's just the anesthesia practice. I think you were trying to trick me there, but. Well, you have it on your slide. Oh, well, I tried to trick you. So that's just the leftover okay. bullet point. So they did not request. Um, oh, it says accounting change, none requested, not required. They did not request an accounting change. Yeah. So the, the, basically, the change from 4.3 to 3.5 to live within the guidance is because of the. The 1.3 million in the anesthesia practice, yes. Perfect. Other questions? I just, uh, <clears throat> just uh, my observations on Southwestern as we go through them is that, you know, this is a hospital that, uh, again, over the long term um, has stayed uh, from 2014 through 2019, uh, projected has stayed uh, below the 3.5% uh, uh, NPR growth mark. Um, the rate increase that they're asking at 2.8%. Uh, is below their five-year trend. Um, they are a hospital that has uh, stepped into the all-payer model quite aggressively um, with um, uh, large percentages of, of their MPR uh, coming from uh, the, the ACO. Uh, <clears throat> they have a relatively weak payer mix and uh, clearly discuss you know, what's going on in uh, Bennington County in terms of, of the weakening of the economy. Um, my one concern with them um, is that they aren't booking any reasons, uh for the all-payer model, but basically have taken the approach that um, it's a 50-50 chance that they're going to be a winner or a loser, and uh, you know that averages out to zero. Um, so uh, you know it, it would be nice to see them kind of you know putting away some uh, real reserves that uh, uh, could cushion any future. Um, uh, missed projections uh, <coughs> Other comments or questions? Maureen? Yeah, I would just comment that this um, this is a hospital <coughs> that continues to meet their projections both on the top and bottom line and so it's one when I look at their forecast I can have some confidence that this is they're probably going to hit this number. They do have a relatively high operating margin but they are, they have an old facility and they're you know, planning to, to use some of that cash and operating margin in the future to add to that. But um, I, they also talk about the fact that they're trying to get their expenses in line with what they're reimbursed for Medicare and that they're you know, focusing on that. So, um, <coughs> You know, definitely on this one, I, I look at them as having confidence. You know, they um, asked for a 
you know, rate charge about this each year, but I would say, you know, I look at their numbers and say I didn't feel hit, so. I would concur with that, and I would also like to add, um, it was quite <coughs> informative to the fact that they are really taking proactive steps in the telemedicine um, field, and they are looking to integrate several forms of that into their hospital over the next several years, <coughs> which will ideally save that hospital a lot of money um, by using those services. They've also been one of the more creative hospitals in trying to deal with the workforce shortages, too. So, kudos to them. Would someone like to uh, make a motion? I'll move that we approve Southwestern's budget with uh, an effective growth of 3.5% after uh, approving the provider transfer as well, and with a 2.8% overall change in charge. Second. So the motion, as I understand it, is to approve the um, provider transfer as well as the effective growth in the change in charge. Correct. So is there further discussion by the board? If not, we'll open it up to the public for any um, comment on the Southwestern Vermont Medical Center budget. Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Copley. Next, we have Copley Hospital. Um, this is a hospital that uh, for several years now has been under significant financial duress. <clears throat> with uh, receiving bottom line revenues. Operating margins um, does require this change in charge as the staff sees it um, to propel that recovery in the coming, coming year. Um, additionally, the hospital does need to make uh, investments in deferred maintenance, as, as they stated while they were here. Um, the facility itself is becoming worn um, from the observer. <clears throat> um, and, and to do that, uh, they can no longer dip into their um, days cash on hand. They need to begin to make some of those investments on a positive operating margin or the hospital faces um, significant issues uh, as it relates to their balance sheet having enough cash on hand uh, for a rainy day, so to speak. Um, their change in charge, the five-year average, as you can see, um, is negative 1.3%. They are at the very bottom of all Vermont hospitals. Um, so this um, overall change in charge here that we are recommending be approved as submitted would help uh, make a dent in that five-year average. Um, certainly not make up all that ground, but they need it for um, survival. Um, and we do feel that is appropriate as a corrective measure. <clears throat> and currently their budget projection is, is coming in under 2.6%, which triggers that cap. However, they are making significant, significant changes at the hospital. Um, which should yield them uh, an improved financial picture next year with the change in charge as submitted. Questions from the board? I think just a question I would have um, really would be on their top line forecast and how realistic it is um, with the changes that have occurred this year, um, and we know some of that is continuing into next year, you know, um, in the orthopedics and things like that. So I, I would just challenge that, you know, their top line number may still be uh, <coughs> risky. Um, and I think that, you know, although it's, it's a pretty significant um, charge increase, you know, they have had negative, uh, negative commercial rates for several years and they were um, cut back last year but i also want to say that that cut back and those changes are not the sole reason why they're in the situation that they are right now because they're missing their forecast and their expenses you know you're not as we've gone through multiple times there's it's very hard to react to expense changes when you miss the top line and so you know i definitely think uh, continuing monitoring next year 
to really see where they're going to be, and I know that's in the plan, and we would do that, particularly because they are a hospital that's losing money, they are struggling, they, um, you know, are teetering on, if you continue to lose that much money, how financially viable they're going to be, so. So I'll just, I'll just pile on on that. I, I, this is a, the hospital that I think needs a sustainability plan perhaps the most, and so I'm going to, again, caveat my approval on this budget on a, a, a significant sustainability plan. Their operating margins have been negative for the last four years. They've relied heavily on orthopedics um, to carry them, and we see what happens uh, when something in that department uh, is compromised. I, I just want to, I read an article, and I'm going to share this with the board, but I think this is uh, a little bit of an omen of things to come. It was in uh, Kaiser Health News, and it was discussing uh, I think what's going to happen in the future in terms of medical tourism and, and that hospitals that rely on orthopedics are going to be in trouble. North American Specialty Hospital is an organization that's recently organized orthopedic treatment in Cancun. And they now pay 40 orthopedic surgeons from the U.S., uh, from U top U.S. hospitals, they pay them to fly to Cancun to do joint replacements in a very uh, upscale private hospital. And in this article, I'm happy to share with anybody. The patient was literally paid $5,000 by her company to go there for the surgery, and the doctor was paid three times what Medicare is paid. And that even with all of that, it was still worth it for all parties to have the surgery down there by a, an American uh, doctor in a very upscale hospital in Cancun. So I worry about hospitals that are relying on their orthopedic practices to make their bottom line. And I know that's been um, one of the ways in which Copley has, has survived. So I, I, I have not really have a problem with the charge, even though the charge is very high, because of the five-year average and, and the rate reductions that the board has made in the past. Uh, so the charge is, I think, reasonable, given medical inflation over time. They're playing catch-up. I worry a little bit about the, the top line being aspirational. but. I am willing to approve this budget with that very big caveat that I would like them to be looking at their service lines very, very carefully, looking about what their community needs, what they can offer cost effectively at a high quality, and how they're going to sustain uh, their hospital in the future. Obviously, high rate increases are not going to be the method to do that in the future. So that would be my comments on this particular hospital. And just to add to that, just maybe we can put uh, some type of time parameter and requirement that they actually come back and present to the board, whether that's you know six months, nine months from now. I'm not saying that, that they're going to be able to do that um, quickly, but you know at least to see where they are with that plan, you know, might be something we should be considering. Yeah, and I think we have to work a little bit with our hospital budget team to figure out what is the framework that we're expecting from these sustainability plans, and I recognize fully that uh, you know, there need to be some parameters, some guardrails, some expectations about what questions we're hoping that these hospitals answer, that it's going to take some time and it's going to involve boards. Uh, so recognizing full well, but I think these are conversations that need to happen. Hospitals need to figure out what they can truly cost-effectively deliver in their communities, given their volumes, given the patient needs in their communities. So I think it's a conversation we need to start. If I could just jump in, I think the Copley Board actually is one of the boards, given the, with their leadership change, that they have started to think about sustainability in a different way. Um, I think they, you know, obviously are probably have more work to do as well because they just started it, but I do think that they have been starting to talk about uh, making sure their community has enough primary care and focusing on other more diversified, diversified avenues so uh, but I agree that I agree that they are definitely a hospital that I'm concerned about um, yeah and I, I agree with what both of you everybody said so far um, I also am a little concerned that there's no way they're going to get to 3.5 percent NPR given that they're 6.3 under whatever they're under 2.6 under, sorry. But 6.3% over projection. Right. That's what you were, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, 
just uh, to reinforce what I think has been already said, uh, I mean, this hospital has has a good track record over the last five years uh, in terms of its NPR growth. That has been um, in that has been a growth rate of 2.6 percent, and their expense trend over the last three years uh, since 2017 has been 2.8 percent. So they uh, they seem to be able to manage um, uh, you know uh, at a scale that's below the 3.5 or 3.5 percent target. Um, I don't really have a problem with their rate increase because if you go back over the last five years, their five-year trend on rate growth has been a negative 1.3 percent. Um, I think maybe the only hospital that has a rate growth trend of, uh, uh, that, that that's in the red. Um, I fully agree with Maureen's, concern, uh, Maureen's concerns uh, and uh, about uh, um, top line um, uh, and bottom line gro growth rates. Uh, they seem to be pretty balanced here, but uh, pretty, pretty, you know, uh, pretty tenuous in some regards. And I agree with Jess uh, in, in that this is a hospital that might want to diversify its portfolio. Uh, in order to not just so be so reliant on orthopedics, because we've seen in the last year or two when um, a couple of doctors are ill or um, that uh, it, it jeopardizes the entire underlying viability of the hospital. But um, in the interviews, and I, this is probably Maureen's question, but in the interviews, uh, we questioned Ms. Dor Dorian about their utilization projections, and I kind of like what she said. She said, I feel pretty good about the utilization assumptions some folks were saying that it could do more, and I said, let's wait and count our chickens when they hatch. I prefer to take a more historical analytical approach. So um, if they're uh, uh, not, uh, don't have aspirational chickens, but are wait, waiting for them to hatch, um, I, I think that's a, um, a, a good approach. Um, so I, I support this budget as presented. Yeah, and I would just add, Tom, to, um, and, and, and uh, Robert, to maybe alleviate some concerns, they're totally <coughs> over their 19 projection right now is 4.3 million. And not that we want them to get there this way, but 3.6 million of that is change in charge. So the rest um, would be either pay or mix or utilization and knowing they had some downward pressures in 19, some of which you know they're working through. It, it doesn't seem like a significant risk. I mean, I think there's always risk, but you know, their increase, uh, I guess, unfortunately, is, is really driven by their commercial charge, as we can say. Would someone wish to make a motion? I'll move that we approve uh, Copley Hospital's uh, budget as submitted with the conditions that they participate in the sustainability planning uh, initiative and that they have monthly check-ins for their fiscal year 20 operating performance. Is there a second? Second. second. Is there further discussion? Before I open it up to the public, I just want to say that uh, I view this as a, a one-time correction and I don't want to send a message to people to come in next year seeking a, a 9.8 percent rate increase because I don't think it's going to happen. Um, on the same token, I agree with Robin that I think this is a, a board that's been working tirelessly to try to uh, figure out what Copley is in the future, and so uh, I'm willing to recognize the past and try to make an adjustment that allows them to move forward. So that'll open it up to the public for any discussion. Hamilton. I'm just going to comment on all of it, um, and that is that the pace and the um, acuity of the move that's obviously going on, on in the board to look at service lines, to look at sustainability, to look at whether these costs and the quality make any sense at all is way too slow, and it's way, in my judgment, and it's far below the curve of what's actually happening to the hospitals. You're going to have more Springfields if you don't move faster. <laughs> Other public comment? Is 
Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Northwestern. Northwestern Vermont Medical Center. <clears throat> um, similar to Copley, this is another hospital that's been under several years of financial duress with bottom lines receding. Um, <clears throat> our, our major concern um, with this hospital is the fact that when we looked back, we saw that their cash on hand is, has um, evaporated by over 100 days, and they are bleeding cash to, to make up for these negative operating margins. <clears throat> And even though it appears now that they are still well above the state average, that type of recession is not sustainable over the long term. Um, they are, in the last five years, just above Copley with their five-year approved change in charge of 0.8%. Um, as many other factors are contributing to this um, recession in operating margins, they are also struggling with the implementation of their uh, Meditech electronic health record, and they really need some focus on, on that as they move forward, as that impacts every corner of their, their institution. Um, the 5.9% overall change in charge, um, the staff is, is, is appropriate for this hospital given their financial situation, and also as a caveat to that would allow them to focus their energies on getting that Meditech um, electronic health care record straightened out in the coming year. <clears throat> Um, as you can see, we've recommended an exemption to the 5% cap in this hospital. We've already approved the two provider transfers, one transfer in, one transfer out, and um, this hospital certainly uh, should require ongoing um, monthly check-ins or quarterly check-ins, however the board sees fit, um, due to the financial health concern that we have for this hospital. Questions from the board? Just uh, my observations here are that this is a hospital that um, has recent trends where um, the top line uh, is, uh, is not keeping pace with bottom line expenses. Over the last three years, the NPR growth has been 3.5%. The expense growth has been 5.5%. Um, in this budget proposal, they're looking to keep expenses at a, at a, a two, um, uh, I think it's a 2.2% growth rate, which uh, if they can do it, um, will be a good thing, but they've got to do it. And in order to uh, kind of reverse this trend of, of operating margins that are, that are in the red. So um, um, my observation is that uh, there's some heavy lifting ahead for Northwestern, and they, they, they've got to be committed to uh, doing that heavy lifting, or um, they will continue uh, to be in the red and eating away at, at, at the cash that they have. Yeah, I would just comment on their um, year over year change. I think 2019 is. Their top line is being depressed, obviously, by this changeover they're having with their inventory system, medical system, and you know that that gives me confidence, at least, that this is not a, so much as an aspirational budget as it is getting back what they lost to kind of some one-time losses in um, 2019. Um, their bottom line performance, though, you know, from a budget of um, mid two million to losing like six million, I mean that, you know, ten million dollar swing is a real concern. Um, and you know, therefore you know, I think we're kind of out to giving them this change in charge and giving you know, giving them the increase year over year, but really monitoring their operating performance. I mean they're one that's having issues with bank covenants. I mean this is not sustainable long term, obviously. They've had cash they could rely on, but this is a, one of the hospitals that's of concern, you know, and will continue to be until we see that change. Jess? Yeah, I'll just add that, again, this is a hospital that I'd like to add to the condition that they submit a sustainability plan. Particularly, I know they're actually undergoing um, a review of their service lines and trying to think carefully about what they can cost the 
effectively deliver in their communities. So it would be helpful to see what that analysis is, what the criteria they use to evaluate what they can deliver cost effectively. Uh, I know they're undergoing expense management uh, discussions. We see some of those reports. So I'm optimistic that they're going to get their expenses under control. I do agree with Maureen that I think their top line miss to some degree is affected by their EMR transfer and that may, uh, they may catch up and, and be back where they were. But again, sustainability for this hospital I think is going to be, has to, for my vote, has to be part of the budget. And I would just chirp in before somebody makes a motion that um, I agree with the uh, monitoring. But again, I, I would uh, argue, just as I argued last week, that I'm not necessarily sure it needs to be monthly and that every other month would probably be sufficient. Would somebody like to make a motion? If I can just add one more comment. Um, the rate here, the rate increase, uh, does seem high at 5.9%. Um, but to give that some context, uh, context over the last um, uh, five years, the overall uh, rate, rate growth for Northwestern has been eight tenths of 1%. So um, uh, obviously this, this rate increase is uh, not consistent with their past trend, but uh, they might be making up for some lost ground here. It's also a hospital that's been very aggressive with trying to find ways to reduce their expenses. I think they should be uh, credited for that work. Any motions? I move that we approve Northwestern's uh, budget with an effective growth rate of 3.5% due to the provider transfer approval and with a 5.9% overall change in charge with the condition that they participate in sustainability planning and check in every other month for operating performance. Is there a further discussion from the board before I open it up to the public? Seeing none, um, open it up to the public. Jill, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, thank you. No, thank you for considering <coughs> this budget. We're very committed to the financial sustainability of our hospital and caring for our community. Our board um, took a first, well, not a first step, a next step in strategic planning just last week and a really coming together of the medical providers because it's very important to get the medical staff engaged in this process going forward. So we're very committed to, uh, to managing this budget going forward. Thank you. Other members of the public? Um, Jeff? Yeah, I just wanted to underline a point that I think board member Holmes made about the sustainability plans, which is that I, I hope there's some degree of specificity about what those are to look like so that you don't get five different kinds of things that don't answer your questions and that maybe put hospitals through hoops that they may not want to go through or be able to. Well, I think to. we were pretty clear last week, Jeff, that we are going to invite people in from your organizations to help create that structure. Great. Okay. Thank you. Hamilton. Can you have your last name, please? Jeff Tiemann, T-I-E-M-A-N, for the Hospital Association. Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wondered if you'd ask the uh, ask the hospital whether the Meditech uh, uh, electronic medical record system is compatible with, um, in order to facilitate vertical integration, whether that system, Meditech system, is compatible with Epic at, I think, which is true at both their both their referring hospitals, both UVM and Dartmouth. Joe, would you like to address that question? It's co you know, the, compatibility. Yeah, the Meditech system, we, we find the smaller community hospitals going with the affordability of Meditech and integration um, across the system. And we're hoping um, over time that there will be linkage um, between Epic and Meditech, or there is some way that in the future, who knows, that maybe UVM Health Network can host the system at more affordable rates um, for community hospitals. So we're very motivated about that. We actually use Epic right now in our hospital because we have um, rotating physicians from UVM Medical Center. Um, so we're able to access those documents um, to care for our patients. But we have a ways to go, um, but we're motivated to make those linkages um, over time. Okay, any other public comment or questions? 
Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Northeastern. Thank you. So before we get into this, I just wanted to, to pause for a second and say the next three hospitals you're going to see, Northeastern, Bradbury, and Grace Cottage, <clears throat> all submitted budgets with NPR um, that was quite elevated, citing mostly uh, increases in utilization. So there's there's some consistency there with the next three hospitals. And when we were making our recommendation, we wanted to go back and, and look at some of these things and, and what's causing it. Um, and upon further analysis, um, as it relates to Northeastern, they have seen an increase this year. Uh, they are up 3.6%, I believe, um, budget to projection. Uh, so they are seeing growth. Um, some of it they're, they're claiming is coming from New Hampshire as we're still confidence in their institution. The rest of it is, is coming from their, their local populations. But the spike really does occur in 19 only. And so we felt as staff that the 7.2% um, growth rate target on NPR was a bit high. Um, we want to give credit where credit is due that they are seeing these spikes, but we also want to allow for a little bit more time as they finish out fiscal year 19 and move into 20 um, to really support that from that from a growth perspective. So our recommendation is um, between 4.5 and 5%. That way they have room to grow in the coming year should that continue and materialize. Um, but also come back in an enforcement time if there's room to increase that ceiling um, based on the further growth that they're showing here. <clears throat> Overall, we would approve their change in charge at 3.5 or um, reduce to reflect the offsetting increases in utilization where volume would make up for that reduced change in charge. Um, we do want to see a little bit more from them from the perspective of cost savings initiatives. This is a hospital whose NPR has grown over the years, but the bottom line remains solid but relatively flat. Um, and to one of the board members, um, points out during one of the budget hearings that we're seeing hospitals under financial duress who are who are who are seeing their their bottom lines improve due to some of these um, cost savings measures that they're taking on. So if they're finding a way to do it, um, how can we get Northeastern on board at the same time? Um, but overall the hospital performs very, very well and we would approve at the 3.5 or we leave the door open for a reduced change in charge. Um, but we do want to see the the NPR come down from what they're projecting. Questions from the board? Maureen? Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think on this hospital, I, I don't necessarily agree that they will only come in at 4.5 to 5%. I think a large part of their change is in 19, so they're exceeding their 19 budget by about 3.6%. So, um, and I think that needs to be addressed and we need to talk about that. But bringing them to either a 4.5 or a 5%, I don't think is realistic to where they're really gonna come out because that, this, this is where we get a little bit caught with budget to budget. So on a budget to budget, going up 7.2% is significant. When you go to their actuals, if we were to reduce them to 4.5%, um, it would only be a 1% increase over where they're coming out into, in 2019. I still don't think that's addressing some of the situations. Um, I don't think they were able to adequately support why things are coming in so high this year. I mean, it just, it was like, it's just happening. It's, we're, we're getting this utilization. But my concern is that for 20, if that's to continue, we could actually see uh, much higher than even what they're requesting. Um, so I think this hospital is going to have to be monitored on a different set, you know, a different way. So what I mean there is, you know, they're coming in 19 to budget. They're up, you know, they're up 3.6. So they're really up 7% against where they're coming in for 19. And now what they're asking for for 20, you know, is is. Uh, not such a significant increase on where they're trending. So I would just be concerned that, you know, putting on a four and a half to five percent is probably, you know, they're going to come in where they're coming in, and I don't think that's going to happen. Um, this is a hospital where last year we did reduce their change in charge by one percent. They're still coming in on their profitability that we requested or that they requested. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know if we look at change in charge, and, you know, but I would just propose that, you know, to the board as far as an option on this one because, partially because we're beating their 19 by so much. And that would be something we can address when their actuals fully come in and whether we take any course of action there or we could start to look at it now. But um, yeah, just, just want to throw that out for discussion. Other comments from the board? <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree with Maureen. If, if, um, if you look at um, you know, their long, longer term trends, uh, their bottom line has been growing at a rate uh, uh, faster than their top line, 4.9% um, for NPR and 6.2% for expenses. But um, you know, their request for 2020 is um, uh, a three, uh, uh, just a three and a half percent over their uh, uh, 2019 projection. So they've already made up a lot of that ground. And uh, um, one thing about this hospital um, is that they have the most aggressive growth trends, say, over from 2014 to 2019, projected at 6.4% or to their proposed budget at 5.9%. Um, there's no other hospital uh, that profiles um, that aggressively. So um, whether it's a, um, uh, probably I think Maureen is right that if we do uh, address this, it should be on the charge side because uh, they're coming in so strong in, in 2019. What that is, I don't know, um, but uh, I, I, I don't think um, it's <clears throat> it's necessary here to, um, to 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 go with their request. I just pop in here. Mm -hmm. um, so two things in the follow-up information that they sent us, um, I found a couple of pieces of their evidence compelling. One was the growth rate in their median age relative to the rest of the state. It does seem to be growing a little bit faster, uh, which may explain some of their increased volume, uh, simply because they have an aging population that seems to be aging faster than the rest of the state. But more compelling to me was the uh, inpatient NPR from the unique New, ha New Hampshire residents. So in fiscal year 2018, they have about 464,000 uh, New Hampshire resident visits. And in 2019, it went up to 753,000. Uh, the growth for outpatient NPR from unique New Hampshire residents went from 1 million, roughly 1 million, 1 million to 1.3 million. So just looking at that, you can see that they are basically getting some growth from New Hampshire. Uh, again, I remind folks that that's economic development to the extent that that's being paid for by commercial payers in New Hampshire and Medicaid and Medicare from New Hampshire, so uh, I worry less about that being the source of the growth. I also want to say, and I want to thank them, because in their uh, supplementary materials answer to our questions, they estimated what they could be doing to reduce preventable ED visits, and in fact said that they could uh, initiate some uh, changes in access to um, Saturday clinic hours, expanded office hours, et cetera, et cetera, that the NPR impact would be about a $310,000 NPR reduction. So I think for, that's not quite, but maybe it's about 1%. So at the very least, I want to thank them for coming in and saying I think that they could reduce NPR by doing some initiatives to reduce preventable ED utilization. So. so I think that's the key that they, they have to be introspective and try to figure out uh, what is um, continuing to be, at least this is my third year going through budgets, and each year they had a, a, a message that we're seeing older, sicker people, and I guess I'd like to reframe that into what can we do to keep our people healthier and uh, out of our hospital. I think that a, a reduction is appropriate um, not sure what the, the correct reduction in NPR is, uh, but I think it's appropriate to try to push them to continue to find uh, more efficiencies and more ways to, to keep people 
out of the hospital. So would anybody like to make a motion? I am not going to make the motion on this one. <laughs> I don't feel like I have a good enough sense of where we are. Uh, I would say personally, I, I, I guess what I would need to understand is for the NPR from how much of the NPR, how much of the 7.2% accounts for the New Hampshire residents. Uh, because what I would lean toward doing is having a better, like an actual calculation of that so that we understood that impact in relationship to what we're approving. Um, and probably some of you math people could quickly do that, but I'm not going to attempt that myself uh, on you know, a public meeting. And um, then I would maybe be inclined to reduce the charge to account for for any, it, assuming that there's some of the growth that's not accounted for by out of state. Because I agree with you, Jess, I think we've in the past consistently held people harmless, if you will, for out of state growth. Um, but what concerns me about this without really understanding how much of that 7.2% is out of state is that NVRH has for a long time been working on a unique model that's really supposed to be focusing on uh, population health and community engagement and I just I don't really see the impacts here and so uh, that concerns me um, so I need so I would just like to have a better understanding of the New Hampshire piece in relationship to the 7.2 percent so I wonder if we don't need a little more homework on this one so I, I think we probably should uh, hit the pause button on this one and come back to this on Wednesday um, anything that staff would like to add No. Anything from the public, Hamilton? I'm just curious whether it would be a better way to come at it by looking at not at the New Hampshire traffic, but to use the EVA figures on what the volume performance is um, for Vermont residents, which DIVA actually has. A, a Vermont patient uh, has, can go across to New Hampshire anytime they want. Same way that New Hampshire can come over here, but if you but if you looked at what was happening per capita to the diva patients, the Vermont diva patients, then you would be able to tell whether what you were looking at is is uh, is increasing in, in utilization in, in actual utilization medical utilization utilization patterns rather than traffic across the board. So Patrick, if uh, staff could uh, reach out to Diva and get that information for us for Wednesday as well. I'll just say I think it's unrealistic. We would even get that information this week, but I think we should reach out for it. I just want to, I think it's a great suggestion. I just don't see it necessarily being feasible even by Friday, but please do reach out, I think. One, uh, one other thought that I'll just throw out there to the board to consider is, um, we can, we can agree or disagree about the volume estimates, maybe that they're aspirational too high, or maybe that there's unwarranted utilization that we want them to uh, reduce. I would be concerned about addressing the, reducing the charge to the extent that medical inflation is real. We know what it is. We know it's about 4%. So the ask of a 3.5% overall change in charge is probably reasonable, um, and you know, we want to make sure that they can make a margin on the care that they are delivering, but we want to also ensure that they're not delivering care that they shouldn't be delivering. So how do we identify uh, volume that doesn't need to be there? And to the extent that they are coming in and saying we can reduce some of our preventative ED utilization, that's a start, perhaps there's more, uh, but I think this issue here is more volume than charge. Yeah, I would just add one thing to that though. I, I don't think that their request is aspirational um, because I think, again, when you base it on where they're actually trending, um, but what we hear so much from hospitals is the fixed cost issue. And when things go down, you don't leverage on the fixed cost. But when things are going up at a 7% clip, there should be some efficiencies that they can gain that help to offset some of the medical inflation. Um, that said, their charge increase 
that um, the 3.5% equals $1.3 million. So it's, it's also not a significant number. So um, adjusting, you know, a percent or something, even if we did that, I'm, I'm saying this could work both sides. It's only $400,000. So it's not that, A, it's going to significantly reduce the overall ask, but um, I just want to put those things out in perspective. So even if we were to say change in charge, I'm not saying that wouldn't be significant on the hospital. I'm saying it both sides, right? You know, reducing by a percent is 400000 Is it worth going through that? But the, but the point of really understanding more are they getting efficiencies? Is their 2020 estimate actually reflecting some of the efficiencies they may get by changes in ED, et cetera? Or um, is it even going to come in higher? And we're going to, you know, I would not be surprised on this hospital if we were here next year and against budget, they're up 7%. Because again, that would only be a 3.5% increase against the prior year. So it's, you know, not saying we rebase or anything, but I just think from a consideration when we look at a lower number of four and a half or five, we really just, we really need to also translate that to what is it over the current year and what's their trend then. And I think that would probably be, you know, an unfair burden to say, you know, to come down to some of these numbers, which would be a year over year increase of a small amount. So I think we'll, you know, debate more on Wednesday about it, but Anyone else from the public? If not, we'll move on to Brattleboro. Okay, Brattleboro. So much like Northeastern, their budget was driven by um, utilization increases that they're forecasting. Theirs would be primarily coming from the Springfield area. Uh, currently, they're operating um, 7 tenths of a percent under budget for 2019, and their request is 7.2% which of course exceeds our, our lever there. Um, they are telling us that they anticipate utilization coming down from Springfield. And when the Springfield incident occurred, um, there really wasn't enough time between that and their budget prep to appropriately account for that. So with our recommendation here to reduce the 4.5 to 5, we want to be realistic that they're not meeting their budget this year, but they have the potential to grow there from Springfield. But as we know, Primarily what they're, they're accounting for here with this growth is from the birthing center. And with Springfield's numbers at the birthing center, um, we just weren't sold on 7.2% um, growth to NPR based on the, the trickling down of those services from Springfield. Um, <clears throat> that said, we want to give credit where credit could be due in the coming year when it regards um, picking up those additional services. And Brattleboro has said they're staffing towards that potential need. Um, so the, you know, you could say that when they see lightning, they're ready for thunder, so to speak. Um, their change in charge of 3.4% we felt was appropriate. They are third from the bottom in their five-year history when it comes to approved change in charge. Um, they are one of those hospitals that in the last um, couple of years has seen um, some financial stress. And this year is a rebound year from them. And we feel that uh, maintaining that 3.4% change in charge will assist in that recovery moving forward. Um, but also bringing that MPR down just a little bit to absorb some of that, that business coming over from Springfield and those patients, but, but not quite um, taking that budget above and beyond what we consider to be reasonable. Okay, questions from the board? Uh, on this one, I would just say, I, I don't think they've adequately supported where their 7.2% request is coming from. And, you know, they, I've asked a few times about the um, percentage, their gross to net percentage is really changing. And that's what's creating, um, they're actually saying they're going to get more dollars, right, from the gross income that they're receiving. And that's what's generating some of this increase. And, my concern about this is I think it's an aspirational budget on the top line. I don't think the top line is going to come in where they're saying at the 7.2%. Their expenses have now been loaded in to increase to get some of this. They lost money in 17 and 18. They're finally making some money this year, about 900000 
they're projecting to make a million dollars next year, but that won't happen if they don't hit the top line. So um, the reducing to four to five, I don't have a problem with. It may even only they may even only get like their three percent. They're they're missing their budget this year, and to turn around and say they're going to get this significant increase, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, not so worried about taking it out of change in charge because I think they're going to need that. Um, so it's a tough one. I think it's just, I don't think they're going to hit the number. I, I don't think they've shown us how they're going to get to the top line number that they're asking for. And so if we were to reduce the top line, it's not saying go back and cut your services or change it. It's kind of saying it doesn't seem like you're going to get there. Maybe one of the ways we help to accommodate that is, you know, when we look at this, um, as far as one of the conditions is that they're coming back in showing us where more quickly where did they end up for 2019 where are they ended up in the first quarter for 2020 to see if they really are trending to this higher number because even with the changes in Springfield it doesn't seem like it's enough to make this number up so it's just a tough one because I just think their, their forecast may be um, aspirational again on the top, like high on the top one so I agree with Maureen and also I, I just want to say that this board has repeatedly tried to send the message out to hospitals that don't be afraid to come in for a midterm adjustment and if um, God forbid Springfield were forced to close under bankruptcy and all of a sudden hospitals were seeing increase in numbers we would welcome them to come in and make that presentation to us. So, uh, at, at least in, in my opinion, I think that the uh, NPR should be reduced. I don't have a problem with the change in charge. They've been historically one of the lower uh, increases and 3.4%, I think is an appropriate number. I think I'm gonna, uh, I agree with both Kevin and Maureen on this one. Um, Again, I'm okay with the change in charge. I'm concerned about the volume. And I would say that some of the supporting materials that Brattleboro gave us about where the volume is coming from, I'll just give you some of the numbers here if this is what I'm concerned about. So for example, rehab visits, their fiscal year 19 budget was at 40,000. They're projected this year to come in at 38,000, 39,000. And they're jumping up next year in the budget to 45,000. So they're not making this year's projection on rehab visits and they have a huge jump next year. And the same sort of uh, analysis comes through when you look at MRI scans, radiology and CT scans, total discharges where they're coming in under budget this year for those particular services and yet the, there's a big leap in, in budget for next year. So I'm, I'm concerned about the aspirational nature, I think. At least I didn't see enough supporting evidence in here to understand, really understand why they're projecting such a large increase in some of these areas. So again, I don't know what the right number should be, but I think a downward adjustment on the NPR, really driven by volume, not charge, is probably warranted. I think uh, we're all on pretty much accord here. Um, I'm looking at a uh, you know kind of a traditional three-year trend where you know they've had 5.4% growth in, in NPR and 3% growth in expenses since 2017 and they have just finally, since 2017, they've just finally kind of got themselves on a projected basis for 2019, uh, projected uh, into the black in terms of an operating margin. And I just think this is one of those things where we need to count the chickens after they hatch um, as well, uh, rather than before they hatch. Um, and on the expense side, they're looking at a um, uh, seven, 7.2% increase uh, against a recent trend of 3%, which is uh, quite aggressive. Uh, so I think 2020 should be a year of caution. Uh, let's just see if these re um, the revenue comes in. I, I don't have a problem uh, with their rate increase uh, because their multi-year trend has been 2.9%. Um, and uh, but I, but on the expense side, um, that they could be swinging themselves right back into the negative operating margins if, if they aren't cautious on the bottom line. Anyone like to make a motion? 
Could we talk a little bit about what, where people are with the NPR amount? And then I'd be happy to make a motion. But I would just be picking a number without really having a sense of the group, I would say, at this point, if I were to make a motion. Well, I'm kind of at five, if that helps you. Yeah, their, their gross charges that they're requesting are up by five. They're up by 5.3 from their 19 projection from where they're trending right now. Um, just to put perspective on where I had a concern is because their revenues from deductions were at 56.4% 56, 56 in 2019 and they're improving to 54.5% in 2020. And typically, when you have a rate charge increase, your deductions actually go up as a higher percentage because you're not getting the reimbursement from, you're getting it on commercial, but you have a higher deduction on Medicaid and Medicare. And that's, that's where you know, I've asked them to go back and try to give us some more answers on that. Because they're actually showing bad debt and free care going up quite a bit, and so that's offsetting some of the change. Um, I would be okay with the 5%, but I, I still think there's some, um, there may be some risk that that's still too high. Um, but. If no one wishes to make a motion, we could put this one off till Wednesday. I can make a motion. I was just waiting to see if anybody else said anything else okay. to say. Um, I move that we approve Brattleboro's hospital with a 5% NPR increase and a 3.4% change in charge increase. Can I make a friendly amendment? Please. Uh, which would be that, again, I think this is a hospital that we should have a sustainability plan for, so I will add that. But the other piece would be that there should be a corresponding reduction in operating expenses that goes with that. NPR and I also would add that um, this is when we should have them come back in, whether it's via, uh, you know, it can be via phone or whatever, just really talking about how are they trending on their NPR year over year change so that if they are missing that number, um, that we'll be able to react, react more quickly to try to adjust the expenses. So rather than you know, wait, let's make it more formal. Where are you, you know, two months in? Are you up 5% or are you up 3% and, and what adjustments are you doing? So I can withdraw and try again. Um, but Maureen, can I just clarify, were you thinking, so the staff had said have them come in at enforcement, I see, um, as an option, but it sounds like you think they should come in sooner than that. Yes. Yeah, okay, yes. So are you thinking like quarterly? Or um, just check in in a couple months <coughs> to start, and then we can. Yeah, because enforcement typically we don't do until like March. February, yeah. March, and that's for their year end in September. Yeah. So I think we want to see where did they end up in the year end. You know, I, I think every two months, so six times a year, to just just be checking in on where are you trending against, because even when we have their actuals for. 2019, that takes a lot longer because of the full P&L piece. They should be able to get where are they trending on, certainly gross, and if not at NPR, much sooner than that. Okay. All right, shall I, I so I'll try again. Um, I move that we approve Brattleboro's budget with an NPR of 5% and a change in charge of 3.4% with the corresponding reduction in operating expenses as to the NPR and with uh, conditions that they participate in the sustainability planning and uh, come back in uh, every two months with an update on uh, their budget. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? If not, I'll open it up to the public for any discussion on Brattleboro Memorial's budget. 
Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Grace Cottage. Thank you. This is our last hospital of the day. <clears throat> this is Grace Cottage. Um, they are another hospital whose NPR growth is being driven by, uh, or cited as being driven by um, utilization increases or anticipated utilization increases. Um, as you can see, they're currently falling short of their budget to projection by 3.2%. Um, and they're requesting 8.7% uh, over budget for a 12.8 or 12.3% increase over their 2019 projection. Uh, we do not see this as realistic moving forward for Grace Cottage. They have noted that their uh, primary practices are very well staffed now, so they could fill um, utilization need, but we did not feel that um, this reflected uh, appropriate budget and we would reduce their NPR uh, 3.5 down to 3.5 to 5 percent in that range somewhere again as has been our, our theme throughout today um, leave the change in charge untouched to cover those inflationary costs so we approve that as submitted um, this hospital is one of particular interest they never performed well on an operating margin and it comes in negative on a, a regular basis. They do have a lot of uh, donor support in their community. However, with talks of a pending recession ahead of us, we would be concerned that if some of those donations were to receive, um, where would that leave Grace Cottage from a financial solvency standpoint? So we do have the additional recommendation here to check in that could probably be amended to quarterly, um, just to make sure that uh, as, as the markets bear out in the coming year, that their donors don't tighten their belts a little bit and cause more financial strain on, on this hospital um, with that non-operating revenue. But other than that, we would reduce their ask, again, to recap, between 3.5 and 5% to give you a range, corresponding reduction in operating charges. Review their NPR again um, around the enforcement time, or as we've just heard, perhaps something along the lines of the same as Brattleboro every couple of months, and then approve their change in charge as submitted. Any questions for staff? Okay, um, I just have a clarification. So uh, I think we should pick one period of time that they would be checking in on operating performance and how they're doing versus NPR, right? So. Um, that we can discuss what we think, whether that should be every every couple months or quarterly. Yes. Um, I have a binder yeah. if that would help you, Maureen. <laughs> yeah, no, just look at one of the, um, yeah, this is, as you pointed out, I mean, a hospital that continues to lose money on a straight operating margin, you know, without the help from the community. So they lost a million three in 17, lost 600,000 in 18, came to us with a budget of a positive margin of 151,000 in 19, are losing 1.3 million. This is coming in at a loss of 264 for 20, um, with a very optimistic um, top line and even if we reduce to the lower end of your suggestion here which is three and a half percent they're running behind budget by three point three percent so that would still be about a almost seven percent increase year over year um, where you know part of the reason that we put in this five percent a number on top of you know where a hospitals coming in is to prevent this and this is one of the hospitals if not for their community really coming in and standing behind them and giving them money, they're continuing misses on their top line and bottom line is a trend. This, this, is, this is a Springfield, except they have the backing of a community behind them um, because they keep missing every year. So to think that they're gonna come in and get this growth rate, which is not eight points, it's 8.7 plus 3.3. It is, they're asking for a 12% growth rate year over year. And they miss every year. We, we've gone through this each year. There's a reason why they're gonna get it, and it doesn't happen. So, you know, I don't object to the change in charge. 
I just object to the fact that it's, it seems you know, really that they're reaching to get there. They did put in some primary care. They have some reasons why. But I do think this one definitely needs to have a monthly check behind it um, as you put in here. And um, just an understanding, I think, is just as going to put in the state, you know, where, where do they, this is less of sustainability because they don't offer as many services. But, you know, what's, how, what are they going to do if they don't get there? Because they have staffed up and they have the expenses. So this is a hospital that rather than trending to the million loss they've had for the past several years, could quickly turn to like a losing $3 million if they don't get the top line and they already have the expenses in. So, you know, it's a challenge of saying, want them to be successful, want them to get the primary care, but, you know, historically, it's, it's you know, fool me once, fool me twice. They've come in each year asking for a higher number, and they miss it. Um, and then to come in with a 12% increase and partially justify it on it, we're small, it's total dollars, it's not a big deal. That's true. But it is when you miss that top line total dollars by a small amount, and then you miss your bottom line by three or four million dollars. So um, I think it's just going to have to be a watch and see. I think we can put in a lower number, as we expect it is going to come in lower. But they'd need to make some changes on their expenses in order to get there, or really support, you know, month by month, week by week, you know, how they're going to get there. Okay. Other questions or comments from the board? I am um, in full agreement with what um, Maureen just profiled. Um, the only uh, point I would make here is that their payer mix is only, I think, 28 or 29 percent commercial. Let me just make sure I got the right number here. It's very small. It's, it's 28 percent. Um, if you look at uh, the um, and the increase that they're asking in terms of the, the burden on, on, on commercial at one point, it might gain them $36,000. Uh, you know, their 3.2% change in charge is, is valued at $116,000. Um, I certainly agree that we need to uh, put pressure on their ex maybe aspirational um, 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 uh, NPR growth, but um, I, for this small towns in Vermont um, uh, community hospital, I wouldn't mind uh, uh, an increase in their their um, charge beyond the request of 3.2 percent. It doesn't cost the system. It costs the system peanuts at 36 uh, that 36 thousand dollars a point, but um, it might say to that community that does um, spend, you know, is very active in supporting the hospital um, and basically looks at it as uh, it's the cost shift. They're out there raising the one or two million dollars that they raise it just to cover the Medicaid cost shift. It does say to them uh, that we appreciate their smallness and that we appreciate uh, their effort to, su uh, to support the community and you know, if, if we give them a 5% increase change in charge, uh, it is insignificant on the macro scale, but on the micro scale, um, I, I think it's an important message. Other comments or questions from the board? I would just say that uh, um, I'm very reluctant to give someone more than what they requested, so I, I don't think I would vote for that. Um, as much as I appreciate uh, everything that Tom said as far as um, really the smallest beautiful mentality about um, what happens at that facility, and they're not trying to be more than what they should be. Their focus is on primary care, um, which is the right thing. And so I, I really think that uh, the change in charge should be granted as requested, but a significant reduction in the uh, NPR. And uh, whether that's three and a half percent, I don't know. I would leave it up to uh, others to try to figure out. Again, I think it's a stretch even to get there. So, other comments from board members? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I could support going to the three and a half, which would be a 6.8% change year over year. Um, understand what you're saying, Tom, about the commercial, but it's so small, even to go up a small percentage, you know, is, is only $30,000 for 1%. And I think they're also trying to balance in their community, not increasing their commercial to those people that are paying the commercial rate. So I, I don't think it's, a, I, you know, I think it would be uh, not misleading, but that's not gonna help them make their bottom line number or top line number, you know, any better. I mean, the, the, of their increase, it's $100,000 of their total increase um, year over year, so. No, I mean, I agree if this were a bigger hospital, I, I wouldn't have made that offer, but um, I, you know, I think it's a small gesture system-wide um, on the commercial base, and, uh, but uh, a, it, you know, Townsend being a very, very small town, it would be appreciated, um, I think, in terms of, of their effort, uh, efforts in the community to keep the community um, uh, generous in their contributions. But I, I, I understand the, the conflict in that suggestion. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? Um, the, I'm happy to, but I, just did you, what are you thinking about in terms of sustainability with this hospital given that they are pretty different from the others? Yeah, they are different from the others in the sense that they don't really offer surgeries and procedures the way the other hospitals yeah. do. Their service line is really limited largely to primary care. But I do think that given uh, potential economic downturns, I think we do need to come up with a better way of ensuring their sustainability other than relying on donations from their community. So. Uh, I think there could be some line in the budget order that suggests they need to be started to think about other ways to meet their bottom line without relying on charitable donations. So, but, but not necessarily include them in the group. I think, yeah. I mean, I'm okay with that. Not including them in the group. Yeah. A different, yeah. a different request of them. Okay. I mean, that makes sense to me, just given that they are already so different. I agree that they do to what both you and Maureen, your points earlier about. Uh, they should be thinking about relying on other sources, but it, given it's such a different place than the other hospitals, I, I, don't, I wasn't thinking that made sense to include them in the group. Um, so I can make a motion. Uh, I move that we approve Grace Cottage, Cottage's budget with a 3.5% NPR growth with a corresponding reduction in operating expenses and a 3.2% overall change in charge with the conditions that they uh, do monthly check-ins on their fiscal year 20 operating performance and that we note concern in their budget order uh, about sustainability, um, relying on donations and recommend that they uh, pursue some planning around that issue. So I would just ask to, uh, for you to consider a friendly amendment and that I think that um, we're already getting information on a monthly basis as they, as they um, transmit their uh, financial Finance. performance to yeah. us. And I think that a monthly check-in is probably overkill. Well, the reason I, I say that is because, you know, what they were asking for is a 12% increase year over year. And if we check month one and they're up 12, and, and, and I believe they had also talked about the fact that they were more fully staffed by now, it's just taking time to build up those practices. So we should be able to see, are you coming in, you know, at 12% over last year for up until the end of 19 and the beginning of 20. So I'm, I'm just not sure how large it has to be, but this was to help them potentially if they really are trending higher to be able to come in faster to, to ask for some type of adjustment um, and to give us confidence that they're going to either hit that number. So I think it's more important earlier in the year than later in the year and that we could back down to going to a, whether it's every two months or quarterly. But that, that was really my point on why, because the, the information gets so lagged, but by the time we get it, um, 
there's not a lot of reaction time. But my counter to that would be that um, would we accept one month as being a trend? And I don't think it uh, um, two months before we start to uh, try to determine if a, a change would have to be made is inappropriate. I just hate to put more regulatory burden on these entities than is necessary. So that's all. It doesn't, you know, one way or the other doesn't matter. I don't know. How does everyone else feel? I, I mean, I could go with every two months. It's just it's trying to help them be able to come in and react faster. Um, I think where where I'm at is I would go with every other month, understanding that they can, they any hospital can come in really at Correct. any time. So I hear you, but I think I'd go with every other month, given that they will already be. I mean, because the reality is, if we see their financials in month one and have concerns, we can call them and ask them to come in early too. Okay, that's fine. I'd like to offer a friendly amendment here, um, <clears throat> but just to follow through. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at their um, uh, <clears throat> 2020 budget over their uh, uh, 2019 projected, and one of the in expense increases that they have is $47,000 in the hospital provider tax. Um, that's something that is out of their control. They explicitly mentioned in their testimony the burdens of the provider tax, uh, on, you know, and and the, the fact of the cost shift of, of, of Medicaid, and so I I would like to um, propose that we increase the charge, change in charge from 3.2 percent to 4.2 percent to uh, cover uh, the significant portion of that increase uh, in the hospital provider tax. I just want to say I would wouldn't suggest we change any charge to any hospital without talking to them about that. We may think that's a good thing, but they may not look at that as being a positive thing. If they wanted to ask for more, they could have asked for more. So I don't agree in pushing back and asking for a change in charge um, and assuming that they would even want that. Um, but that's yeah. my point of view on that. I'm not going to do intubation, it's just my proposal. Yeah. And uh, I, I would have uh, uh, felt bad leaving here if I didn't make it. Okay. Well, first of all, we have to know whether or not uh, uh, the maker would even consider it to be friendly. Well, so sorry, Tom, sorry. but uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go with it as a friendly amendment because for the reasons that Maureen said, like for we don't know how their charges compare, for example, uh, we can't, because the HSA is included with another hospital, we can't even really know how that hospital compares to Brattleboro. So we could be dramatically increasing somebody's, what somebody would pay in their deductible without really understanding that, which then could drive volume to Brattleboro because it's 20 minutes away. So it's not like going to Brattleboro is particularly challenging. Um, so before we get lost in a procedural uh, mess, is there a second to the underlying motion? Right. I, I was just going to say this won't be the first time that there hasn't been a second to my motion. So. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm asking for a second to right. Robin's underlying motion first. Second. So oh, it, it, has, it has been so excited. So now, Tom, you have the uh, uh, right to offer it as an amended uh, amendment to the motion. You have that right, if you so desire. Um, I, I, I will offer as an amendment to the motion um, the uh, you know as, as we've been through the rate rate review process we know that uh, insurance rates are, um, are are kind of broad based uh, in, in nature um, not specifically applied to uh, at, you know at the town level um, I uh, always have great respect for what uh, Robin says um, so and I know which way this well, it's going to go, so I just don't want to waste your time anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second to the uh, amended? Seeing none, we'll consider it as a failed amended motion. Is there further discussion on the underlying motion? If not, I'll open it up to the public for discussion on Grace Cottage. Hamilton. So a question and a comment. Does this budget include a budget to run an emergency room? Yes. 
my comment then is, that's ridiculous. They have 20 minutes from Brattleboro. They've talked for years about whether you need it. We still have a, we're still running an emergency room in Springfield. And it's a hospital of this size, running an emergency room makes no sense at all, given how close it is to these other things. Operationally, that, that's, operate, that's just a waste of money. And if you, and the overall question in this hospital, why it's a hospital in the first place, it ought to be an FQHC. Okay. Is there other uh, comment from the public? Yes. Kylie Kemper, Office of the Healthcare Advocate. I just wanted to say that I appreciate the board giving so much careful thought to not increasing a, a charge, um, especially considering how many comments we we see about uh, about the public's uh, trying to deal with high deductible health plans. And anytime you increase the commercial charges, um, it makes it harder for people who have not yet met their deductible, even if it ha doesn't have a huge impact on the overall rates. So I just want to say I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Other public comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So Patrick, uh, um, I think I heard you say that uh, that is the extent of the uh, recommendations that you have for today. Correct, that concludes our work. Well, it doesn't conclude our work, but for today. <laughs> for today. It looks like, uh, if my math is correct, we have five hospitals left to go. Yes, all three in the UVM Health Network, um, Adam Scottney and um, the formerly paused uh, Northern State will be up for Wednesday. Okay. With that, is there a motion to adjourn for today? Second. Okay. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, I heard Robin make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll see everyone Wednesday at 9.